automatically remove Okay, got that. So let me give you just a quick example um, of, of one example of value-based care and payment and a very, very simple, simple, but powerful thing. This is uh, Dr. Lawrence Kosinski, who's a gastroenterologist uh, in the US who started a program several years ago called Project Sonar. Um, it started with him identifying an avoidable spending opportunity. He found that um, he got data from a health insurance plan and found that 50% of what the health plan was spending on patients with inflammatory bowel disease was for hospital admissions of patients with exacerbations. And less than a third of those patients had seen their physician in the month prior to hospital admission. So he redesigned care. He said, I wanna be able to do proactive outreach to these patients rather than waiting until they have a problem. Let me find out early if they're having symptoms and be able to intervene. He called it sonar because he viewed it as pinging the patients um, while they were um, uh, out in the community to find out how they were doing and then to be able to intervene early. The problem was that there was no payment to support the nurse who would do the monitoring and the technology to be able to do that. So he convinced um, the health insurance plan, this is Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, of Illinois in the US, um, to pay the practice for hiring the nurse and for using this symptom monitoring technology. And the results were dramatic. 50% reduction in hospital admissions, and importantly, from the payer's perspective, 10% reduction in total spending, even though they were spending more to pay the physician practice for the nurse and the technology and improve quality of life and productivity for the patient. So a win, win, win all around. The problem is most patients can't get that kind of care because specialists in the US are paid for office visits, not for proactively contacting patients. And patients, in fact, in many cases, health insurance plans try to discourage them from seeing specialists as a way of uh, reducing spending. So again, here, payment reforms are needed to remove the barriers to better care. Um, and most, unfortunately, value-based payment programs do not remove these barriers and therefore they don't support delivery of value-based care. So how should value-based payment be designed? That's what I wanna focus on today. Uh, it doesn't start by payment models and bundles and population-based payment. It starts by having clinicians identify specific areas of potentially avoidable spending in the area in which they work. And I listed a variety of these earlier in chronic disease, maternity care, cancer treatment, surgery, and a variety of other places. So that's the first step is where are those opportunities to reduce uh, avoidable spending? Then the next step, which is important, which is what everybody who's involved in trying to develop value-based care approaches thinks about is how you design services that will actually deliver better care and the services have to reduce that avoidable spending. It will vary tremendously depending on what you're trying to do. It may mean wellness care and screening. It may mean spending more time for diagnosis of new symptoms. It may mean palliative care for serious illnesses. Whatever it is, that service has to be specifically identified. Then if the current payment system doesn't support the delivery of those services, in some cases it will, but in many cases it does not because it will not pay for those services the way they're want, you want to deliver them or they will cause a loss, then there needs to be an adequate payment to support the higher value services. And I will talk about what exactly how one structures that. But in order to make sure it's adequate, you have to know what the cost of the higher value care is. And I will come back to that in, in a moment. The final step is that if in fact you believe that this different approach to delivering services will in fact reduce avoidable spending and if you get paid adequately to deliver those services, then there should be accountability for delivering value, that value-based uh, care. Um, and if you can do that, all of those four steps, I think that you can achieve what I would call a win-win-win, which is that you have win for patients, they're getting better care without unnecessary services, the providers are getting adequate payment for delivering high value services, and the payers are spending less. Now, let me talk more specifically about some of these steps. Um, to define an adequate payment, you have to know the cost of care. 
Um, and the problem is, in many cases, no one knows what the cost of care is. Payers think that they know what the cost of care is, but they don't know what it costs to deliver care. They know what they spend, what they pay, and that's not always any have bear any relationship to what it costs to deliver care. Providers, hospital systems often don't know. Um, many systems have put in place time-driven activity-based costing and other cost accounting systems to figure out what it costs to deliver care. But that tells you what it costs today to deliver the non-value-based care. It doesn't tell you what it will cost to deliver the value-based care. So you have to have a cost model to tell you how the cost will change as you implement value-based care. How much is it going to cost to deliver the new services that you want to deliver? How much of the current cost of services is variable, semi-variable, meaning it will only change with large changes in volume or fixed, meaning it's not going to change except over a longer time horizon. And those costs in general will depend on how many patients you have and what types of patients you have. Let me give you a very simplified example just to explain what I mean by this notion of a cost model. I'm just going to take a hypothetical example of a home-based care program. And in this program today, purely hypothetically, there are nurse care managers who are hired to travel to the homes of patients to help them manage their chronic disease. And I'm assuming that a nurse is paid $80,000 a year and can manage up to 100 patients at a time. I'm assuming that the travel expense turns out to be about $200 per year. There's office space and other overhead costs of $100,000 that could support up to four nurses. That's the basic structure of the program. And so if you look at that and you say, well, if we have... 50 patients, what will it cost to serve them under this model? Well, you would need, if the, the nurses can handle up to 100 patients, you would have one nurse. Um, you'd have these significant fixed costs uh, of setting up the program, the cost of hiring the nurse of $80,000, variable cost for the patients. Total cost for this program would be $190,000. That's a lot per patient. That's $3,800 per patient. But look what happens if you get more, and this is often how programs start. They start with small numbers of patients. If you get 100 patients, twice as many patients, you don't need any more nurses because the nurse can handle up to 100 patients. Your fixed costs don't change. Your variable costs change slightly. The cost of the program only goes up to $200,000. The cost per patient drops dramatically to $2,000. If you have 150 patients, you need another nurse because one nurse can only handle 100 patients. You hire another nurse, which increases the cost. That's the semi-variable cost for every 100 more patients. You need another nurse. That increases the cost of the program, but surprisingly enough, maybe the cost per patient actually decreases because those fixed costs now get spread across a larger number of patients. And you can carry that out and see how those cost per patient change based on volume. At some increased changes in volume, they may go up a little bit. In some cases, they may go down. You can see that if you plot that out. Many programs have very high costs in early stages when they're recruiting and then the costs go down. But the point of this chart is that at any one of those levels, the amount of payment that's needed to cover the cost will be different. Moreover, costs depend not just on the number of patients, but on the type of patients. Now, I said a nurse can manage up to 100 patients. I didn't say what kind. So let's assume that that's 100 lower need patients. If you need, um, if you, a nurse can manage fewer higher need patients, say 50, then all of a sudden I'm going to need more nurses with more patients and the cost per patient is going to be higher than it is if I'm only managing lower need patients. And again, the same payment will not be adequate um, depending on what kinds of patients I'm serving. So when I talk about adequacy of payment, you have to know what costs are and the types of patients that you're serving in order to figure out what the appropriate amount of payment is. Um, and those differences in payment are not going to be in general the same as the current differences in spending. Payers often look at that and say, well, we'll pay you something related to what we're spending today. But they may be spending too much on the lower need patients and too little on the higher need patients. Um, and this is one of the problems with current risk adjustment systems is that risk adjustment systems tend to be based on what the payer is spending today for different kinds of patients, not 
what it actually costs to take care of different kinds of patients. And we need to move to a system that adjusts for that. Now, what, assuming we know what it costs, what payment method should be used? Well, you might be surprised, I'll tell you, that there's only basically three different ways to change the payments for services. Despite all the, the, the talk about complicated payment systems, you can do one of three things. You can either change the fee amounts for the current fees, you can create new fees, or you can bundle payments together in some fashion. Um, and in some cases, the simplest and best approach is to simply say, let's add another fee to pay for these services that can't be delivered today because there is no payment for them um, and pay that way rather than trying to change anything else about the current system. Because if that's the, if that's the barrier, just fix that barrier. So in my example of Dr. Kaczynski, he needed a payment to support the nurse and the technology. In other cases, a bundled payment is most appropriate because you're saying we really want the flexibility to be able to do different things rather than being constrained by a series of individual fees. Um, and you can bundle together some of the services that are paid by current fees, as well as then be able to deliver services for which there are no fees currently. Here's the challenge though. Too little bundling can lead to overuse. That's the problem with the current fee-for-service system. Too much bundling can lead to under-treatment. And that's the problem with many capitation payment systems or what is now being referred to as population-based payment systems is that they can result in under-treatment patients. What you want is something in the middle and you have to understand what the risks of overuse and under-treatment are to be able to set that up appropriately. Just as examples of this, as I said, too little bundling occurs today. We pay for office visit fees in many cases, certainly in the U.S. and uh, until the pandemic. Um, no one paid for any other way to deliver care like telehealth. When you start paying for telehealth, you have a dramatically different structure. But if you don't allow that, then you have a, you have a problem. Hospital DRGs. Um, in many cases, are they are they're fine from the hospital's perspective, but they exclude physicians, they exclude the cost of complications, all of which are integral parts of that care. Too much bundling. Many people are proposing episode payments for maternity care. I think that's a bad idea because it assumes that somehow everybody should get the same level of prenatal and postpartum care, and that's not the case. Same thing with in the US, the Medicare program has created episode programs for chemotherapy. And the problem with that is that it assumes that somehow physicians can control the price of chemotherapy and they can't. Appropriate bundling are things like monthly payments for chronic disease management that are stratified by the level of need because you don't want it to be tied to office visits. You want the flexibility to deliver different care. And episode payments for necessary surgery that include complications and post-acute care can be appropriate um, if they're designed uh, properly. Then if you've chosen a method, the question is what exactly should the providers of the value-based care be held accountable for? Um, the concern that people have had now for a number of years has led to a lot of discussion about value-based payment is that under the fee-for-service system, you get paid for delivering the service regardless of the outcome. You get paid the same amount if you have a good outcome, and you get paid the same amount if you have a bad outcome. Um, so many people have proposed that value-based payments should be outcome-based payments, that they should tie payments to outcomes, that you get paid if you have a good outcome, and you don't get paid if you have a bad outcome. Sounds good in theory, doesn't work well in practice in most cases for a number of reasons. The first problem is that those outcomes, generally the ones that you care about, occur long after the services are delivered. So if you deliver good preventive care and you prevent colon cancers and heart attacks and you don't have amputations of diabetics, that doesn't occur today or this week, it occurs in the future. And you can't expect people who are delivering care to wait for the outcomes to be determined in order to be paid. The second problem is that those outcomes are in general only partially controlled by the provider. And a variety of other factors, patient comorbidities, the patient's willingness to actually follow an evidence-based treatment plan, poverty, all may 
preclude a patient from doing what is needed to achieve a good outcome and the physician or hospital can't control that. Third problem is while people claim that somehow risk adjustment is going to fix that, it can because risk adjustment doesn't and probably will never be able to adjust for all of those factors. Um, there may be adjustments, but people may end up still being penalized for outcomes that they can't control. And the fourth problem, and I think one of the things to be really concerned about is that if you try to tie payment too closely to an outcome that can't be controlled, the what, what you may force providers of care to do is to start avoiding the higher risk patients that are more difficult to achieve good outcomes with. And so outcomes may look good, but it's because you're avoiding the patients who need the care the most. If you look at what people who achieve good outcomes do to achieve good outcomes, what they do is they deliver appropriate evidence-based services to achieve good outcomes. And people who don't achieve good outcomes generally fail to achieve um, uh, that because they're not delivering the appropriate kinds of care uh, effectively. So what that leads to um, is uh, thinking about how do you actually tie this to guidelines. There are guidelines in many cases to identify which services will improve outcomes. Um, in some cases, if you're developing innovative new programs, there may not be, but in many cases, a lot of these opportunities for avoidable, reducing avoidable services are simply following the guidelines that exist. And they have, they have built in them, for example, the cho what's called choosing wisely in the U.S., um, has I specifically identified things that evidence shows really should be avoided. So I think a natural thing to do is to say, rather than trying to tie value-based payment to outcome directly, you should have value-based payment be based on the delivery of evidence-based care. So if you follow evidence-based guidelines and only deviate whenever there are legitimate reasons for doing so based on the patient, you should be paid more than if you fail to follow evidence-based guidelines without justification. Um, so what that leads to is saying it's accountability for delivering evidence-based care. It's not accountability for reducing spending, which is a big difference in terms of where value-based payment has been uh, going. Now, I wanna emphasize, there are some outcomes that can be controlled by providers. So preventing infections and complications in surgery can be controlled by providers and not delivering the wrong service to the wrong patient or the wrong side are things that can be avoided. And where those outcomes can be controlled, it is very legitimate and desirable to have a payment tied to those controllable outcomes. That could be bonuses or penalties based on performance. It could be a warranty for complications or no payment at all if the controllable outcome isn't achieved. But many important outcomes are not controllable by, by providers. So whether patients have uh, better diabetes control and whether or not cancer uh, remission is achieved and whether or not there are um, uh, problems of morbidity or mortality that are caused by the patient's living conditions, those are things that are not, that are not controllable and they're inappropriate for accountability. And that's where I think that we need to be focused on payment for evidence-based care. So you can have some outcome-based payments and some payments tied to evidence-based care. And if you do all that, I think you can get to the win-win-win that I talked about uh, in terms of value-based care. Win for patients, win for providers, and win for payers. Now, I wanna emphasize that it's only a win from the payer's perspective if spending is going to be lower. And this is why it's very important to be thinking about these avoidable spending reduction opportunities. Many people who deliver value-based care approaches de develop really desirable sounding approaches. They may even reduce avoidable services, but it costs more in total to be able to do that. Um, and uh, that is not a good value proposition from the health insurance plan's perspective, because you might say I'm achieving better outcomes for the patients, but they're saying I have to spend more and that's not what I'm willing to do. Um, so it is very important for anyone working on value-based care to be thinking about the cost of what it costs to deliver that value-based care, not just the outcomes achieved. The services have to be designed to be both efficient 
in terms of minimizing costs and the amount of payment needed, as well as effective. Because what you want to do is to create a strong business case for implementation by the payers, as well as by uh, the provider organization. And I'll give you what I see as 10 steps to achieve this business case. This notion of a business case is really important in terms of value-based care if you want to be able to be paid and be able to sustain that approach and not just do a demonstration project that then ends up being terminated. The first, as I said, is you need to define the plan change of care and the expected results. That's the, that's the foundation of value-based care is saying I'm going to deliver care in a different way and achieve something better for it. Then you have to estimate how the type and volume of services will change compared to today. Then you have to determine how the costs of those services will change, as I described earlier with a, with a cost model. You also then have to figure out how payments will change under the current payment system, because that's where some of the barriers that come up today exist. Then you need to change, calculate the changes in the operating margins for the providers, which, and if the provider is losing money, then you need to say, what changes in payment do you need to have in order to be able to deliver that approach to care in a way that is not going to cause us, the provider, to lose money? Then you come to a decision point. The question is at that point, if you change the payment in that way, is there a business case for the provider to do this? Will it be better financially for them? And is there a business case for the purchaser or the payer of care? Um, and what you do next depends on whether the answers to those two questions is yes or no. If the answer is no, then you need to go back and try to find ways to improve the efficiency of the care that you're delivering. Um, uh, and there are often many ways to do that, but it starts by saying we need to find a way to do this at a lower cost. Um, even if the answer is yes, you need to be thinking about, well, what could go wrong? What are the kinds of deviations that could occur? Because oftentimes many people do the one projection based on the best case scenario. Um, and it turns out um, that um, if things don't go quite that well, uh, the outcome would be, would be worse. And then you need to design a payment model that addresses that, a payment model that supports things when things go well and also supports things when things don't quite go the way uh, you expect. Uh, and that includes thinking about adequate payment for services, accountability for cost and quality, and how you adjust for patient need and risk. And these 10 steps, uh, there's a document you're, you could download for free from our website, paymentreform.org, that describes all of this uh, in more detail. But I'm going to try to walk you through very quickly today uh, an example of this. Um, and I'm going to show how you might go about developing the business case for value-based care. And I'm going to focus on uh, care for a chronic condition. And I'm going to take a very simplistic example of this. Um, um, and I'm going to assume that the current services are consist of nurses, similar to the example I described earlier, who make phone contacts and frequent home visits to patients to evaluate how well they're controlling their symptoms, how well they adhere to, they're adhering to their treatments and whether they're having problems and need intervention. Um, and, the, and I'm going to presume that the current services aren't working as well as we would like because many patients still experience problems in between the visits that they get, uh, but don't contact the nurse in a timely way. And then many of them end up being in the hospital because those problems aren't addressed. So I'm going to presume that the notion of the value-based care model is to change that and to start using some kind of remote monitoring equipment to keep track of how the patients are doing so that you can identify more quickly uh, which patients are having problems and uh, then uh, try to achieve better control of their symptoms and better adherence if that's the problem or intervene early otherwise and to achieve then less severe exacerbations and higher quality of life for the patient, but also have the patient uh, end up being hospitalized less often. So here's how you might go about developing a business case and a cost analysis for this. So you'd say, let's assume, I'm going to assume here that there are 400 patients and they're today getting on average two visits per month from, from nurses. So it's a total of 9,600 visits per year for these 400 uh, patients. 
And I'm going to assume that this program has eight nurses employed to make these visits, which is about five visits a day, which depending on how close the patients are, can be a, a, a pretty busy schedule. So the primary cost drivers for the program today are personnel and overhead. So these eight nurses, if you assume they're making $80,000, it costs $640,000. I'm going to assume that there's a $100,000 overhead um, and a small amount of travel costs associated with them. And, and these are really just simplified uh, costs to illustrate this today. I'm not trying to say that this represents what it would actually cost to, rep to run a program like this. But under these simplified hypothetical assumptions, the cost of this program for 400 patients is $836,000 per year. I'm going to further assume that the revenues for this program today come from fees paid for visits, that there's a $90 per visit fee. And the reason why I'm using $90 is because the assumption that assumption leads me to believe that this program can cover its cost, that $90 payments for 9,600 visits a year will end up with a small profit margin for this particular program, okay? So now I wanna to try to change this. I wanna get a new program, this new program in place. And so the first thing I have to say is what am I gonna do differently? I'm using this remote monitoring equipment and I'm going to achieve better outcomes by doing that. Um, so I'm going to assume I have the same number of patients and I'm going to assume that I'm going to buy this new monitoring equipment and that this new monitoring equipment costs $300 per patient. So that's one cost change that's going to occur. I'm going to assume that with the monitoring equipment, I don't need to make as many visits to the patients. So we're going to have only 7,200 visits and I'm going to assume that I don't need as many nurses. So I'm going to have seven nurses instead of eight nurses. Um, to be able to provide this new higher value approach uh, to care. Um, then I need to add all that up and say, well, if in fact I do that, what will that cost? So fewer nurses, more equipment, um, I end up with 2% higher uh, costs. Now the problem, this is the barrier in the payment system, if I'm getting paid per visit and I deliver fewer visits, then the revenue is going to go down by 25%, even though the costs are going up by 2%. Um, and that creates a problem for the entity that's doing this. And so why would they do this if it's going to lose them $200,000? So you then say, what kind of a payment change would I need to be able to address this? Well, one simple approach would be to say, um, I need to be to pay for the equipment. So let's suppose that the health plan gives the provider three hundred dollars uh, per patient um, to pay for the equipment. That still ends up not being enough to cover the cost because those per visit fees now still are not enough to cover the fixed cost of the program. So I'd have to say, what do I need? I need a hundred and five dollar payment per visit for the smaller number of visits to get enough revenue to be able to cover the costs. So with those costs and with that change in payment, there is a business case for the provider. They are be able to deliver this care and not lose money. Is there a business case for the payer? No, because the payer would actually have to be spending more to deliver this care. Now, the business case for the payer, though, isn't necessarily just these payments for this service. If, in fact, this reduces hospitalization, which are potentially very expensive for the payer, and I'm going to assume, again, just for purpose of discussion, that the health plan pays $10,000 for each of the, visit, the hospitalizations for these patients and that they're currently being hospitalized 10% of the time and that could be reduced to 8%. Well, if you do that, the payer is saving $80,000 on the hospitalizations and only paying $12,000 more for the services. So that ends up being a reduction in the total spending. So it's now 5% less total spending for the payer to be able to do that. So now I do have a business case for the payer as well as a business case for the provider. Now the payer may be skeptical about the ability to reduce the hospitalizations, may say, I want something stronger than that. And the, the provider should go back and say, well, maybe there's a way to get some more efficiency out of this. Maybe I only need six nurses 
rather than seven nurses. And so I don't need quite as much of an increase in the visit fee. And that will still then enable me to make a profit um, and deliver a better uh, case to the payer. That's part of the discussion that often goes on in these kinds of things. And so, you know, what, what can you do in terms of costs and payment? And then, as I mentioned, this is all based on one set of assumptions. So you have to say, well, what if the outcomes aren't as good as expected? What if they don't do as much as well as we expect in terms of preventing hospitalizations? What if we have need more services than we planned? Um, what if it costs more? What if this equipment costs more than we expected? Um, and if there's only a successful business case under the optimistic assumptions, then you need to change the care model so that you can find a way to have greater flexibility that when things don't go the way they should get paid appropriately. The payer is going to look at this and say, I'm concerned. Are you, how do I know you're actually going to reduce the rate of hospitalization? How do I know that this equipment that you're using is really going to be effective? And how do I know that the staff will follow up appropriately? And how do I know that this program is only going to cost what you say? What if the nurses continue to make as many visits and I'm paying by the visit? So costs could actually go up from this. And what if you admit more patients to this program? So there's a variety of ways of dealing with that um, in terms of accountability models. You can create a performance bonus based on the actual reduction in hospitalization. You could say we're going to recoup a portion of the visit payments if the hospitalization rate increases. Um, you could put the provider at risk for the total spending on the patient's care. You could cap the average number of visits. There's a variety of different ways to do that. Part of the discussion is going to be what should that be? Some of these approaches though that are attractive for payers are problematic for the providers because that accountability that sounds good to the payer could mean financial risk for the provider. And health plans are in a much better state to be able to take on financial risk than many provider organizations are. Um, that when I talk about provider risk, what I'm talking about is that the cost of delivering the services could exceed the amount that the payer is paying. And it's important in terms of doing this to think about why might that occur? So costs can be higher for a variety of reasons. It could be because the provider is delivering care inefficiently, using unnecessary staff and supplies, overutilizing services, allowing avoidable complications to occur. There's other things though, in terms of this, those, the cost of that equipment goes up unexpectedly, or you end up with an unusually costly patient or higher severity patients. The things at the top of the list are things that providers can control. That is generally referred to in payment models as performance risk. So the provider can figure out how to avoid those kinds of cost increases. These other things are things that often providers can't control. So they can't control what the device company charges for the device, and they can't control what kinds of patients uh, end up uh, coming in needing the care. That's what's called insurance risk. Um, and providers should not be expected to take insurance risk. That's the job of insurance companies. So there are four mechanisms that if you're developing a contract, you need to think about building into the contract. If the payer wants you to take financial risk, you have to think about building these mechanisms in so that you can separate the insurance risk and the performance risk. Those mechanisms, and I'll just cover these very quickly, are what are called risk corridors. Uh, what that means is that if there is a small increase in cost, the provider might be accountable for that, but if there's a big increase in cost, the payer takes a bigger share of that. Second is the notion of a risk exclusion. So for example, you'd say, I'm not, I'm accountable for what services cost, but not for what drug uh, manufacturers charge for their drugs. That could be excluded from the, the cost accountability. You could have out, what are called outlier payments or stop loss payments so that if you have an unusually costly patient who really just needs lots and lots and lots of services, um, there's an additional payment for that. Um, and you should have some kind of risk stratification to say that if in fact I get a higher severity population of patients, the payment should be higher for that. The goal in doing all of that is to protect the provider against the uncontrollable cost. The provider can be at risk, for the things that they can control, but should not be at risk for the things that they cannot control. Um, and many payment contracting discussions um, spend more of their time thinking about these kinds of things um, uh, than sort of just what is the value-based care approach. To do all this, you have to have data. 
Um, and you have to figure out where is the opportunity to avoid avoidable spending? Why could in spending increase or decrease? And how likely is that to occur? What are those specific circumstances? So that you can identify realistically what could happen and build that into the contract. And then retrospectively, if spending goes up or goes down, you have to be able to look back and say, why? Why did that happen? Um, not to have people pointing fingers at each other and blaming each other for that. And again, the goal is win, win, win for the patient's provider and payer. Now, there may be some circumstances in which you can achieve better outcomes and they require higher cost services. I think the question will occur in many cases as to whether or not that means that if that is the case, should the insurance plan pay more? Or should the entities who are benefiting from the improved outcomes pay, pay more? So if an employer is getting their patient, their employees back to work faster, but it costs more to do that, maybe the employer should pay for that. Or if the patient gets um, more convenient care, maybe they should pay more for that. Um, and there may be a business case that should be defined for those other entities as to why they should pay some of that additional cost. But again, that you need to identify what those specific things are. So I'll wrap up just by saying, how do we get to these win-win-win approaches? Um, and I think this is very consistent with the discussion in, in Peter's presentation earlier. Um, you have to design the payment and the care delivery together because the payment needs to support the care delivery model. Otherwise, you're not achieving anything for it. The problem is that payers, if health plans design payment systems, they will naturally design things so that they win. And they will try to get the maximum reduction in total spending, the minimum change in payments, and the maximum shift in financial risk from them to provider groups. Providers, their natural proclivity is to do things so that they win. They want to be paid more for everything. They want new payments for new services, take no accountability for outcomes and no financial risk. Um, and it's very hard for payers and providers to meet in the middle whenever each of them has designed something where they win and not the other. So there has to be a collaborative process to say, let's design something that works for both where there are savings, they're based on avoidable spending, and there is adequate payment based on the number and types of conditions of care. And the providers are delivering services in the most efficient, effective way possible, and are taking accountability for the things that they can take accountability for. In my experience, it is difficult for providers and payers to achieve this without some kind of facilitator, somebody who can help each side talk to each other. There needs to be shared data. Everybody needs to believe the data that they're using and there needs to be trust. And one of the things that is most lacking in healthcare today is trust between payers and providers and it will take a while to restore that. So there are lots of other um, um, materials available on this. Uh, we have lots of reports. These are all free. You're welcome to download them. You can either get them at CHQPR, Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform.org, or there's also a very detailed explanation of what I refer to as patient centered payment at patient centered payment.org. And with that, um, I will uh, wrap up and be happy to take any questions, challenges, or uh, disagreements that you may have. Thank you very much. Um... We promise to keep the easy stuff for the end, right? So I'm an economist <laughs> of this, but I understand not everybody thinks, oh, wow. <laughs> well, what sort of questions uh, do we have for Harold? Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I was wondering, we understand the challenges of using outcome-based payments, but also we have challenges with evidence-based payments. First of all, uh, we do not have evidence for every condition. I mean, definite evidence. And secondly, we have to leave room for the uh, clinician expertise. We know that any care pathway will cover around 80% of patients, and then you have like 20%. So I would like to hear your thoughts on uh, how do you address those challenges for the evidence-based payment? Thank you. 
Well, if we think about this as a longer term process, then you would say we should be following what evidence exists where it's appropriate, which is not every patient. Um, we should be measuring outcomes and we should be using the measurements of the outcomes to improve the evidence. And then as we can develop better clinical practice guidelines, we should be following that. That's, that's what any kind of performance improvement should do, is to say, we're not achieving good outcomes here. Let's try something different. Let's test it. Let's see if it's working. If it does work, now we have evidence and now we should be doing that until we try something different. Um, so in some cases, we have lots of evidence about uh, what works and it's simply not being followed. In other cases, we have very little evidence um, and you make that distinction. I think it's important to emphasize when I say not have outcome-based payments, I don't mean you don't measure the outcome. The issue is whether or not you try to base someone's payments directly on the outcome itself. So you can follow what evidence there is and you can say, I'm also taking accountability for documenting um, uh, when there are deviations from the guidelines or when the guideline is not appropriate so that we can then monitor what was done, measure the outcomes of that, and then based on that, actually develop some new evidence about whether or not the thing that we tried because there was no evidence as to what to do actually worked or not. And over time, we hopefully will get more evidence. An interesting question is today, how do we get, it? How do we get more evidence? If in fact, you can't try anything different because there is no payment to support doing anything different, then you will never get better evidence about what works. So I think that we need to be thinking about this as an evolution and how value-based payment can support a learning healthcare system, one that actually works continually on developing and expanding evidence rather than trying to lock people in to what happens to be known today. Does that answer your question? Marcia said yes. She nodded. <laughs> questions. Other questions. No, I have a question. What you sort they're of all, showed? They're all again. worn out. They're all worn out, Fred. No, they just started. Okay. They should they should be energized about all this? They love contracts and cost. Um, Harold, I I have one. You you sort of showed at the end, and I used that recently quite frequently that you have these papers for different types of uh, disease areas, right? You, you said chronic, palliative. Um, Peter showed that he had a contract on acute care. Uh, and I know uh, he's not here now, but uh, I know that thinking about with Silver Cross on, on sort of taking that model and put that sort of same model on chronic care or on primary care or other care. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but maybe you could explain why, let's say, the acute model care uh, is so different than some of the others that you showed and, and why we should adjust for it. So um, acute care, and again, I uh, let me say that there is exceptions to everything, right? You know, what do you mean by acute care? But so if you have an acute need that is going to be addressed by some procedure or some short-term treatment, um, and it's clear who's going to do it, it's clear what the outcomes are associated with it, then an, an episode payment for that is perfectly appropriate. We know how to do hip surgery um, and um, uh, we know we can pay for that. Now, there are some patients who are more complicated, but for many patients, there's no reason to say we're gonna, we, we can't just, we can pay a single amount for that to cover all the costs associated with that and with a warranty for outcomes. Chronic disease management is a, a very different thing in general. It doesn't begin and end at a particular time. Um, uh, first thing you have to do with chronic disease is determine that someone has it um, and what they have. That's a diagnosis stage that um, we oftentimes just sort of wave our hands and assume that the diagnosis got done accurately. And in many cases, it, it, it doesn't. So focusing on getting an accurate diagnosis, figuring out what a, an appropriate treatment plan would be based on the current 
drugs and treatments that exist, which change monthly, it seems, um, and then trying that for a period of time to determine whether it works or not. So the fact that someone has been diagnosed with a chronic disease doesn't mean that you immediately know how to manage that effectively. In many cases, there takes time to say which kind of drug works. Um, and oftentimes we have patients, for example, who end up getting escalated to bio expensive biologic drugs early on because no one spent the time to help them manage and uh, manage the, the treatment that they have with a less ex with a less expensive drug. And then patients change over over time. Um, you know the the uh, patient with diabetes who becomes pregnant uh, needs to have a different care while during their pregnancy than necessarily before um, or after that. Uh, and so the notion that somehow there's just one episode of chronic disease management or that all of a sudden you can have one monthly payment forever for that just it doesn't it doesn't match with reality. And moreover. Um, Who's managing the chronic disease can vary from month to month and year to year. Um, some patients at some stages can be managed by a primary care physician, a general practitioner. Some may need a specialist. The specialist may need to be involved only at the diagnosis stage or at the, um, uh, at the care planning stage. In some cases, they may need to be involved on a longer term basis. So you have to have, in my opinion, separate payments designed to support each of those phases of care and to support the care that different uh, people will be delivering. Uh, cancer care uh, is kind of in the middle in the sense that um, uh, in some cases it's a chronic condition um, and it's going to change over time. In some cases it may be a short-term acute thing and in some cases it may be um, somewhere in the middle. Um, and I think in the U.S. Medicare has tried to treat chemotherapy and oncology care as some kind of a fixed predictable episode um, that lasts six months and that they can have a, a payment for it, yet they don't distinguish um, what kind of lung cancer or colon cancer you have uh, because it matters a whole lot in terms of what drug you're going to take and they're trying to hold people at risk for the cost of those drugs. So I think you have to look at each health condition separately and say, What's, what's the method by which we deliver care or should be delivering care? Who's delivering it? And what is the services that they're going to be delivering and how to pay for that? And not try to push everything into a simplistic, we're going to have an episode payment for everything. Okay, Harold. Thank you very much. Um, um, so I, I learned with acute care works. I really loved all the work there with the different sort of types of, uh, that you had in these different papers. I know Medtronic early on also figured out some types where they created different type of payment models from themselves. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, I think we have a more solid ground on uh, on how to get this going. I'd like to thank you very much. I know, as you know, I really appreciate uh, the, the working together and the relationship with it, and, and hopefully you will join trying to figure out uh, at least better showcases of how we could more fairly uh, pay uh, and get out of some, uh, in my view, oversimplistic uh, economics, I'm an economist, oversimplistic economics and risk-adjusted models that are actually doing more harm. Uh, I see some hospitals where acute care is now covered in these contracts, sort of works, and then let's do that, let's do that all on all the surgical stuff. And uh, guess what? That's, that's creating a lot of confusion within the surgical stuff because the very, bariatric surgery is very different than something in, in cardiology or, or heart surgery, but it's still sort of lumped together because it seems so, it's, it seems to be surgery or it seems to be chemo, but it's not surgery or it's not chemo, uh, although you may, you may think that you don't have a value-based uh, uh, idea. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Harold. Uh, we thank both you. have a passion for this. Uh, hopefully we will uh, see more work of you and everybody here to get into this process of trust where we have a more fair uh, payment Thank system. you. And, and yeah, those of you who are working on the Dragon Projects, congratulations. I read through all of your projects. You're doing really exciting, exciting things. And I uh, wish you all the success with that. If anybody has any specific questions, my email is here on the screen and you're welcome to send me questions. Uh, and thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much.
And uh, looking at the team here, uh, I think I'm, I can conclude. Oh, you want to make that? So I, I, I'm not seeing everybody of the team here, but I think they did a marvelous job because I only have the sort of pretending I know and talk a little bit, but there's a lot of logistics. I hope you enjoyed and appreciate their work. Thank you very much for the flexibility we need with this, but let's have a round of applause for that team. <laughs> But they're gonna have a, we're gonna have a busy day tomorrow with the price. You know, you're all more than welcome to uh, to follow that. We're gonna start a little earlier, so people who came from abroad can have this lunch together, and we can meet and we can talk uh, a little bit before we go into into the price. And uh, with that, you want to do some logistical announcements, I think. So thank you. I hope to see you tomorrow. There'll be some drinks and snacks and some time to still mingle if you like downstairs. When you do it, 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 when you do it,